on uh, today's topic, Today's Lepers in Your Church, over to Bonnie Nicholas and Carol Reinstra. Bonnie's the Director of Safe Church Ministry for the CRCNA, and Carol Reinstra is Chair of the Micah, Micah Center Beyond Prison Advocacy Group and Coordinator of Prisoners in Christ Contact. Bonnie and Carol, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you now. Hello, everyone. This is Carol. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to work with Bonnie and talk with you about congregational responses to situations, complicated situations, that deal with criminal sexual conduct. You will have, as Kim said, an opportunity to engage with us later and react to some scenarios. Let's start out by considering how and why the term leper is used so often when speaking of persons with a criminal sexual conduct conviction or history. As you know, in Leviticus, it says that a person with leprosy should remain unclean as long as he has the, the disease. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. There are many other references, and they all seem to justify a posture of separation. And this is the way persons with criminal sexual conduct histories are treated. Registered sex offenders in many states can't live within 1,500 to 2,500 feet of places children frequent, such as schools, churches, or bus stops. The sensationalizing and stereotyping feed into the wrong notion that all sex offenders are child predators. We need to be reminded that while all child predators are sex offenders, not all sex offenders are child predators. Even in the church where we claim to all be sinners, lepers if you will, in the sight of God and in need of salvation, we hesitate to learn about and relate to those who have committed such sins. It's ironic because most such offenses are not discovered or prosecuted. So in reality, the people who have been caught, convicted, and punished are the ones we need to be the least afraid of. In fact, we could be learning a lot from them because they seek to be engaged in our churches and want to give of their skills and experiences to help others. But Jesus healed the lepers, as a story in Luke 17 tells us, and today he still heals and gives hope to those who have offended. We can create positive, healthy environments for all. Hi, this is Bonnie. The Office of Safe Church Ministry has received many inquiries related to this topic, which is why it was chosen for the topic of Abuse Awareness Sunday in 2013. The resources are available on our Safe Church website, including the um, bulletin insert that you see pictured here. One of the few of the questions we hope to answer today are what are the critical points to consider when someone who has a sexual offense becomes involved in your church? What have other churches done in regards to this question? And where can I find some useful resources? We hope that this webinar will help answer some of your questions, though it probably won't answer them all. We do hope that you will take time to look at other resources that we have posted on our website as well. One resource we have posted on our website is an article from Christianity Today about sex offenders in the church. Um, it, this, as you can see from the graphic here, many people don't think that sex offenders should even be involved in the church at all. But most people, 79%, believe that they should be involved, although they believe that some limitations and supervisions will help that involvement. You can see here that 5% say sex offenders can be involved with no limitations or no supervision. And if we don't have policies around this issue, in fact, if we have not even considered or thought about this issue, then by default, we're standing with that 5%. We're saying that it's okay for offenders to be involved in our churches without any limitations. We really need to consider this issue. We really need to understand that it's important to keep those boundaries in place. There's a tension that we need to navigate here. And I use this picture of a shoreline because the boundaries are not always black and white. It's not like a wall. It's more like a shoreline with ebb and flow. 
The tension we have to maintain is between offering a safe environment at church, a nurturing envi environment, and at the same time, we have to exemplify God's grace to welcome those who have offended, because we are all sinners saved by grace. A balance must be maintained between these two things. And in considering being a welcoming place um, for everyone, we also have to consider those who have suffered abuse. Because having a person who has a sexual offense in that safe place at church can be very traumatic for someone who's experienced abuse. So we also have to consider those people when we think about making our churches safe places. Now it's easy to be either an open congregation or a protective congregation. Many congregations are inclined either to one side or the other. They're either opening, open and inviting, or more closed and protective. I'm wondering how you would characterize your own church as you think about that. Now our society sees openness and protection as competing values. But as followers of Jesus Christ, the church is called to hold these values in dynamic and creative tension. This is the way we more fully embody Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a person who crossed boundaries, but also a person who showed love and concern. Another resource on our website is an article by um, the organization Dove's Nest, an organization committed to protecting children. And it gives a lot of ideas of what, um, what churches can do. First, churches need to develop a protective environment, especially for children and those most vulnerable. Policies must be in place. A safe church curriculum for children can be very helpful, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Children need to understand what to do when something feels unsafe. They need to identify those feelings and know how to go to a trusted adult. Um, adults need to understand and learn how to respond to those who have offended as well as to those who have survived abuse. We have a lot to learn so that we can be more effective in our community. The first thing is to become aware, knowing the needs of both survivors and also those who have committed sexual offenses. Churches need to take precautions and safety must always, always remain the top priority. Churches can't do it all on their own. Churches need to know they have limitations and seek help from others. We're in this together. Right now we're going to do um, something that safe church teams love to do. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I was jumping ahead. First, we're going to take a little look at what Scripture says because I'd like to begin with a foundation of scripture. And these scriptures are especially important to safe church ministry, but I think also for our discussion today. So we're going to begin right at the beginning in Genesis. And here we read that we are all created, every one of us, in the very image of God. And that in itself endows us with inherent dignity and worth. God saw all that he had made, and he said that it was good. Though his, his image in us has been marred by our fallenness and our sin, it's still there. And we are also all one body. Each one affects all the others, and every part is needed. The ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you. We are all one body, and to function as we're supposed to, all those parts need to be healthy. We have a lot of hurting parts in the body of Christ and it's affecting the way our body can function. So we need to take care of those hurting parts, and we need to work together as one body. Also, Jesus loved children. In Matthew 18, it said, if one, anyone caused one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better if a millstone was hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. Those are harsh words, but what they show is Jesus' love for children, and we are all God's children. One passage of scripture that is especially meaningful to Safe Church, and I think to this discussion as well, is about uh, misuse of power. We read in Philippians 2 to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility to value others above ourselves. 
Jesus was our great example of that. Jesus, who had tremendous power, all power in heaven and on earth, never used his power for selfish gain, but only in loving service to others. He had a humble attitude, and we are called to have that humble attitude as well. I think that um, ex-offenders and people who cross boundaries often misuse their power, and it's something we have to recognize and watch out for. Okay, now we're going to go and find out what some of you think about some issues that relate to ex-offenders. Our first scenario is any town Christian Reformed Church decides to begin requiring criminal background checks for volunteers who work with children and youth. To everyone's surprise, the record of one longtime cadet volunteer came back with a criminal sexual conduct, or CSC, offense from more than 20 years ago. What should the church council do? Immediately inform the volunteer that he may no longer serve as a cadet leader? Schedule a meeting with the volunteer to find out more information? Ignore the offense. It happened so long ago or A and B, but not C. And now Kim is going to launch a poll so that you, our viewers, can choose which of these four options you think is the best. Okay, we're seeing that a majority of you suggested scheduling a meeting with a volunteer to find out more information. No one said to ignore the offense. And now Kim is going to move to the next poll. Okay, in our next scenario, we have Pastor Anywho who has just had a meeting with a couple in the congregation who recently discovered that a church member has a criminal history, sexual history involving offenses against more than one child. The couple is very upset that they didn't know about this and that someone with this kind of criminal record is allowed to attend church. They are concerned about the safety of their own young children. They are also influential members of the church and good financial supporters. They have threatened to leave the church if something isn't done. So what should Pastor Anywho do? Should he dismiss the couple's concern? The church must be a welcoming community to all, right? Should they tell the person with the criminal sexual history that he must leave the church? Should they schedule a meeting with the church council to discuss this situation? Or should they schedule a meeting between the person with a criminal sexual offense What, oh, okay, between the couple, I'm sorry, with, between the couple and the person with a criminal sexual history. What do you think, Pastor Any Who should do? Kim, launch your poll. All right, looks like we see that scheduling a meeting to discuss with the church council is the most popular option. And that seems like a great option to me. Communication around these issues is so important. We need to be talking about them. Okay, Kim, you can move that poll. Scenario three, why not? An involved church member and loving mother has refused repeated requests to work in the church nursery. Finally, when pinned down on the issue, she confessed to a church member that she has a criminal sexual conduct offense on her record. She explained that when she was falling in love with the man who is now her husband, they had consensual sex, which is found out by his parents. Since she is two years older than he and he had not yet reached the age of legal adulthood, his angry parents had charged her with rape. She served time and they were married when she was released from prison. Should why not be allowed to serve in nursery? Yes, 
she's a loving mother and devoted church member. Yes, of course. The fact that she's married to the man now proves that it was consensual sex. Or B, no, I mean, no, it is against church policy, which must always be followed. No exceptions. D, no, those who've had sex before they are married are not fit to work with children. Kim, launch this poll. We see there's some differing opinions on this one. It's against church policy, the policy that if you have a criminal sexual history record, you should not work in the nursery. Some of you feel that way. Let's move on to our last scenario. And by the way, that last one is a true scenario. I had a church call me with that very scenario and wonder what to do. Um, I'll just let you know that I recommended that they follow their church policy. There are a lot of ways that people can be involved in the church without being in nursery or in Sunday school if they have a record of criminal sexual history. Anyway, let's move on to this one, number four. Vivian, a married woman, was sexually assaulted by a church member. He threatened her if she told anyone. One month later, she had a nervous breakdown and sought counseling. With a counselor's help, she was finally able to tell her husband about the assault. So what should Vivian's husband do now? Should he confront the perpetrator and ask him to leave the church immediately? Should he file charges against the perpetrator? Should he encourage Vivian to continue to receive counseling and leave that congregation? Or should he inform the pastor and encourage him to call a meeting with a mediator for all parties? What do you think Vivian's husband should do? Okay, we see most people think that the pastor should be informed and encouraged to call a meeting with mediator for all parties. Mediation can be a little tricky in these emotionally charged situations, and I would recommend a, um, a professional mediator if that was the decision. Filing charges is always a good idea. Perpetration will not stop if we don't file charges and convict people who perpetrate violence. But one reason I included this scenario is because it it shows us that there are sexual predators among us that have not been convicted. In fact, Dr. Lasik has done research on what he calls the undetected rapist. It's startling research. These crimes go unreported and unprosecuted. Um, in other cases, a plea deal may have been reached, so a criminal record may not reflect an actual crime that was committed. So it's important that our policies not depend only on a background check. A background check can never act as a standalone screening procedure. It will never detect a first-time offense or those who are undetected among us. A screening process should always include an application, interview, and checking references. Um, all right, we're going to move on now. As these four situations demonstrated, each case is unique and complicated. Some of them had clearer answers than others. They each warrant prayerful and careful analysis and discernment. And to study the facts about criminal sexual conduct helps at least a committee or a group of people in the church to be, become a little bit more expert in the area. We should know that there are different types and degrees of criminal sexual conduct crimes. In Michigan, for example, there are four degrees uh, under the law, and they cover a range of sexual conduct and levels of force or intimidation. Survivor re resistance is not a factor in assessing criminal sexual conduct, and the law is gender neutral. Marital rape has also been illegal in Michigan since 1988. Trying to understand some of the causes of sexual and behavioral perversions Many people talk about changing cultural values, internet pornography, violence portrayed in the media, or mental health issues. 
the area of lack of accountability and support is one that I think churches can deal with. And we can do a lot to build a healthy functioning community so that we go beyond safety to a, a situation where people are flourishing. There are many myths and facts about criminal sexual conduct, and I'm just going to list a few of them because um, I'm sure you could come up with more. Most sex offenders commit another offense. According to an in-depth study of about 10,000 released prisoners by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the reconviction rates for new sex offenses by those offenders over a three-year period were only about 3% for all types of sex crimes rape, statutory rape, sexual assault, child molestation. The myth that child molesters spontaneously attack when they see a pot potential victim is not true. Sex offense rates are on the rise. That is questionable. It's probably more the conviction rate and the awareness and the media attention. Strangers assaulting children. Actually, the truth of the matter is that children are assaulted by someone who knows them, a family member or neighbor, more often than by a stranger. The myth that treatment for sex offenders does not work has been disproved. Treatment that is geared toward the type of abuse and the reasons behind it can be very effective. Residency restriction laws reduce offenses. Actually, residency restrictions are fairly recent, and it is unclear if they make communities safer or not. News coverage of sex offenders has increased over the last 20 years, although the incidence of sexual assaults dropped during the same time. And the news media actually encourages these myths. The public and our politicians have opinions shaped by the media, and they and that results in legislation to cope with fear and creates a, an illusion of safety rather than actual protection. Trying to understand those who offend is important because they're not all the same. Some people cross boundaries out of ignorance or negligence. Perhaps they have put themselves in a vulnerable situation. A person may not fully understand the power that is inherent in his or her position and it unintentionally crosses a professional boundary. This may or may not be a criminal offense, depending on the situation. Some people are sexual predators and gain a particular kind of excitement or satisfaction in the experience. Most sexual predators have multiple offenses before they are caught. And of course, pedophiles are the ones that we spend the most time creating laws and registries and restrictions for because it is um, a very serious offense. But these situations are rare. Looking at the predator or the um, person who commits an offense, some of the common characteristics would help us get, understand how to prevent problems and how to respond appropriately. There may be denial, if not flat out denial, at least a minimization of the actions taken. Often the one victimized is blamed with phrases like, she came on to me, or he had it coming. Excuses and rationalizations can be a part of the blame game. I was drunk, or I didn't mean anything by it. Often there's a lack of understanding that a wrong has been done and an inability to experience the empathy toward the one who has been wronged. What is needed is for a per perpetrator to take responsibility for her or her actions and acknowledge the harm done and what is, do what is possible to make amends. That's why a covenant um, understanding should be created between the perpetrator and the community in which he will be working or living. We also have to understand our own natural responses, even aversion to those who have been labeled criminal, and especially those with a criminal sexual history. Responding out of our own sense of fear or otherness will be felt by the one who has offended. Then, because of their own emotional issues, they may react um, in ways that they're not even consciously aware of. 
but may be hurtful in building trust or genuine relationship. They may have learned behaviors that were helpful to them in one context, but now are hurting them in their new context. The emotional reactions that we have can have a huge influence, even when we're unaware of them. All of us have much in common with those who have offended. We must move beyond the us and them mentality to promote the kind of relationship that can provide honest accountability. Um, shame is one of those emotional responses that's very common with those who have offended and also with those who have been victimized. It's very complex, but it often plays a big part in our emotional reactions, whether we're aware of it or not. Shame can be beneficial. If someone has no shame, they could be narcissistic. Um, but if they have toxic shame, on the other hand, Shame can make them feel worthless, depressed. And in either one of those situations, no shame or too much shame, um, it can lead someone to be unable to form healthy relationships and to live in the community, such as the church. Now, as a church, we have to learn to understand and manage these shame reactions. Shame brings with it feelings of vulnerability, rejection, alienation, and separation from others. The effects of shame can govern us without us even realizing it. We react out of our own shame response rather than responding to one another in an intentional way. And if we lack awareness about the way we are treating one another and awareness about the way we're being perceived, that can really hinder any kind of effective relationship that can lead to restoration and healthy community. Bill Strew is a now retired psychotherapist, and he's worked a lot in the field of shame and its impacts. He once told me, we're all bipolar, you know. We're all sinners, but by God's grace, we are God's covenantal children. That is true for all of us, whether we're saints or criminals. We need to maintain an awareness of God's grace in our own lives so that we can extend that grace into the lives of others in our church. That's the only way we're going to be able to become the community, the church that God is calling us to be. The idea of sanctuary, uh, we could probably spend a whole webinar on that one idea. There are so many images in scripture, a cloud of God's glory filling the tabernacle temple a holy place, a very holy place that cannot even contain his glory. There are the cities of refuge in the Old Testament, refuge for those escaping from retribution from others. That's a kind of sanctuary too. And the idea of providing hospitality to strangers, which goes all through scripture, fits very well with the idea of sanctuary. More recently, many churches are part of a sanctuary movement providing safe haven for those who are vulnerable and need protection. But we have to understand that in our desire to create sanctuary, it's actually the boundaries that we put in place that creates a safe space. There is no sanctuary where there is no safety. Boundaries are a necessity. And again, we have to consider those who have suffered abuse and how traumatic it is for them to be in a same place with someone who has abused. It's, um, it's traumatic. So how do we create a safe sanctuary for everyone? Our prayer is like the song, Lord, prepare me, prepare us to be a sanctuary. And part of that being prepared is to be prepared before um, someone who has offended joins your church. You want to already have policies in place. Some churches are not ready for, the, for an offender to join their church. You have to know about the behavior of the one who has offended, understand the dynamics of offending. You also need to know the resources that are available and develop a detailed plan for um, before the person joins your church. So I want to encourage you to visit the Safe Church website. We have sample policies there, sample covenants of conduct, 
A covenant of conduct is something that is an agreement between the one who has offended and the church that limits their involvement. For example, it may say that they can only come on Sunday morning, that they may not um, go to places where children are in the church. Some churches have set up COSAs, C-O-S-A, which is a community of support and accountability. Um, some churches have a partner that accompanies that person who has offended any time that they are in church. Policies must be in place. So we want to be prepared to prevent any, um, any real risk of reoffense. We want to make sure that that's as little as possible. Strong policies in place, supervision is really important, and education is important. The congregation needs to be uh, aware of what is going on and how to respond and be aware of potential dangers. I just want to point out the circle of grace here. This is a program that Safe Church is promoting for children. It helps children understand when something feels unsafe. It helps children understand how to go to a trusted adult. It's a prevention tool that is so valuable and is so valuable, especially in a church where there are people who have offended sexually. We've talked a little bit about, and we will talk more about restorative and covenantal frameworks. Um, the church is uniquely in a position to provide support to those who have offended. We can provide, as a church, spiritual resources that no other organization can supply. And so we need to take up our part in this situation. We need to do our part along with other organizations. How to do that? In a report to Synod in 2005, the Christian Reformed Church in North America affirmed principles of restorative justice and urged congregations to employ restorative justice practices whenever possible to foster healing and restore community. In addition, the Abuse Victims Task Force report in 2010 included a significant discussion of the role of restorative practices in cases of church leader abuse or misconduct. That report says that justice is defined by right relationships. And when justice is violated, we are called to right the wrong, to restore broken relationships and reestablish peace within the community. A hallmark of restorative justice practices is that they take into consideration and involve as much as possible three parties, the victim, offender, and community. And what that looks like in terms of building a successful covenant of conduct or COSA is that their victim reparation offender responsibility, and the communities of care reconciliation intersect. The more they intersect, the more effective will be the outcome. There are excellent training resources available. This past summer on the C2C bicycle tour, my husband and I had the opportunity to meet Stan, another cyclist, who works in some Canadian schools to facilitate peacemaking circles and restorative practices. He also is involved with the, the Shalem Network. The website is on this screen, which provides training in faith care, communities affirming restorative experiences. There are many other resources available in our communities. There are city safe haven types of places or, or places that people can call for help. Healing Communities is a network of churches that tries to help congregations become better prepared to welcome those returning from prison. Um, a 70 times 7 life recovery organization in western Michigan helps um, people in the recovery process, those who are re-entering society, as well as those looking for freedom from addictions and habits. 
And we don't want to forget that secular and government entities have a strong interest in protecting the public, and we should be working with them. They have tried to do this um, protection role by establishing sex offender public registries. We already heard that those are not always the most effective way to find out who has committed an offense. But in Canada, the public does not have access to the National Sex Offender Registry. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police do, and that provides them with the information they need to improve their ability to investigate and prevent crimes. Persons who have served time for sex offenses are often mandated to get therapy and re are responsible to pay for their own treatment um, and get to that treatment. But since employment for a registered sex offender is so difficult to find, this is an area where churches could help out, either by providing transportation or showing support to encourage participation in the therapy, in some cases maybe helping to pay for it. Whatever, the holistic treatment programs should include some fundamental principles related to victim-centeredness, specialized knowledge and training, monitoring and evaluation components, and collaboration. If these principles are followed, then all through the investigation, prosecution, and disposition of a crime, as well as assessing the person's needs, supervising them, treating the problem, and reentry will lead to a healthier community. So collaboration and coordination are very important. We first must listen to victims and offenders. The Evangelical Lutheran Church recently um, published a report on crime and punishment called Hear the Cries, Hearing the Cries, Listening to People, Learning from Others. There are many faith-based organizations in churches and in denominations. We can learn from other denominations. There are groups such as Genesis Group in Grand Rapids, similar to probably um, other support groups in your areas. Canada is home to some of the most advanced treatment programs. Offenders who are under parole or probation supervision have the guidelines to follow, and the church should collaborate with them as well in making a covenant with the offender. And if someone is no longer under supervision, you still want to stress the importance of being accountable. The goal of any arrangement with persons who have hurt or who are hurting is to grow into a healthy, functional network of strong relationships, accountability, collaboration, and trust. So when you go to the website, the Safe Church website, you will not only find sample covenants, and articles, but you will find worship resources to help your congregation grow in understanding and compassion for victims and offenders. Use these prayers and litanies for healing, protecting, preparing, and welcoming persons who've been victimized as well as those who've offended into the body of Christ. Our prayer should be that we grow beyond being safe and welcoming to being flourishing and joy-filled covenants of trust and love. That is truly the work of God among us. We look forward to your questions. Thanks, Carol and Bonnie. We've got a couple of questions have come in from our audience. And for those of you that wanted to wait and see if your question was going to get answered along the way, um, now's the time to send it in if your question didn't get answered during uh, the presentation. So I'm going to go first to the um, first question that came in. How many years do persons with CSC normally serve, and are they cured when released? How many years do they serve in prison? That depends on the type of offense. It can be anywhere from a few months 
to dozens of years. And of course, whether or not people are cured depends on the treatment that they receive while in prison. Some prisons offer, some states or federal penitentiaries offer good treatment programs. Others, it takes so long for people to get into the programs that their release date is put off and put off, and they never have a chance to build healthy relationships. So I guess that would be my answer to that question. OK, I'm not sure if this question would be for you or Bonnie, but um, what are the major characteristics of covenant agreements that churches and people with CSC implement? Um, yeah, we have a couple samples of covenant agreements on our website. One is in a kind of a list form, and one is um, in a paragraph form. But usually, those will um, limit a person who has a sexual offense so that they can only be at church at certain times, so that they would only be in certain places in the church. Um, in other words, if the, all the church school classes are down in the basement, the covenant of conduct may say that the person is not allowed to go into the basement. Um, I actually visited the program in Western Michigan that was mentioned, the 70 times 7, and they have their whole children's area. Um, you need, like, um, that's super secure. You need fingerprint access to get into there because they have so many ex-offenders in their church, many with um, criminal sexual history, that they work very hard to keep their children safe in that environment. So they have a special children's area. Again, it really depends on the church. So each covenant of conduct will need to be adapted to fit your situation. And the main idea behind it is to keep the children and those most vulnerable in the church um, protected. OK. Had, Could uh, I add something to that? Um, uh, it also depends on the offense. And again, we have to repeat that not all sex offenders are child predators. The, Im the assumption many times by churches is that that's what we're dealing with. And, it, and so it, dealing with the person who has offended is a very important step in creating a, a covenant of conduct and knowing what their limitations and needs are. Okay, and I just want to mention to the, uh, Bonnie mentioned the Safe Church website. Uh, for those of you that have your um, computer screen up and uh, looking at it, at the top right hand side says for more resources related to today's webinar topic, please visit the Safe Church website at, and there's the URL is there, and it says to click on the ta click on information for abuse awareness 2013. So before anybody asks the question, the website address is up on the screen, and we'll put it up one more time before we end today. Um, Let me just say, too, on, the, on our website, on the left-hand sidebar, you'll see where it says click on Resources for Abuse Awareness Sunday. And if you click on that, it'll get to you to 2013 is all about this topic. OK. And we have several more questions have just come in. Should all parents be informed if person with CSC is attending and how? That's a very good question. And churches have handled this in different ways. Um, some churches do send a letter out to all parents, letting um, parents know. Um, other churches choose not to do that, but only have a few key people in the church know. It's really, that's really the minimum for, in my mind, is that a few key people really need to know. The person who is in charge of um, youth group, the children's ministry coordinator, um, a couple elders and the pastor, you know, you need to have a group of people that is aware of the situation so they can maintain extra vigilance. But whether or not to inform all the parents is um, a decision that churches make on their own. And again, that might depend on the offense, on um, the, how, you know, what they feel the risks are. You always have to weigh the risks and the, um, and the costs. Uh, along with the benefits of any action that you take. And so churches need to work that out among themselves. OK. Here's a question for you. If an, uh, an offender never accepts responsibility for his actions, do you see any way a church can welcome him into full fellowship? I don't think so. And, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the offender has to talk about it in order to take responsibility. Um, it could be that you know from, 
from the history and from the parole officer that the, per the person has taken responsibility, has served his time. A lot of these crimes, too, people age out of. Um, so I don't think it means that if you set a person down and say, what, how do you take responsibility, that they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't be honest with you. Um, but definitely, if they are resisting and still perpetrating behaviors that are worrisome, it would be important to say, we cannot have you in our congregation. Okay. Um, I would agree with that and just want to add that it, that's often a long process. Um, I know many people who work with ex-offenders and um, they say it's often six months in weekly group before an offender will even realize that they are, um, that they are starting to see that they have caused harm. It just takes that long because a lot of times they've learned patterns of thinking, that um, they don't have the empathy skills necessary to really understand the harm that's been done and take that responsibility. So often that's a long process of taking responsibility and professional help is needed. So, um, but yeah, I would agree that when, a, when an offender does not take responsibility, it, it's, it makes it very difficult and you have to be extra wary in those situations. Okay, here's another question. We've still got a few left here. Uh, do sexual predators see churches as an easy place to prey on their victims? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And we read um, some of those characteristics of minimization and denial and, um, and often um, people who have offended sexually are very charming people and can make very good first impression. And um, church members who want to be, are kind of naturally welcoming, who are naturally wanting to see the good in people, um, you put that together with someone who's ma manipulative and can come across very well, and it's just a very dangerous combination. So um, I would say yes. And one thing I like to recommend to churches is that they um, put their safe church policies on their website so that a predator who is looking for a church can say, oh, well, they have a safe church policy. Maybe I won't go there. Maybe, you know, it just shows that you're aware of this and care about your children. So I would encourage churches to make their safe church policies known. Um, that can be a deterrent, I would think, to a sexual predator. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's one about uh, background checks, and we did have a few questions come in on registration forms about these as well. Uh, one of our audience says, I have a hard time finding a reliable source to run background checks. Do you recommend one? Um, I, I really feel I should have a better answer to that question than I do, um, but I don't. Uh, in, I know that in Michigan, um, uh, advantage that we have here is that background checks are free for nonprofits through iChat. So it's only that's only a statewide background check. So if you have an offender that moves around from state to state, that will not pick up that. It's not. Um, there's different levels of background checks and um, different prices that you pay for those. Um, and the the market changes so rapidly that it's very hard to keep up with the best um, place to get background checks. And that varies state to state and province to province as well. But it's important to realize the, also the limitations of a background check. Um, the background check will not predict a future offense. It may not show an actual offense if there's been a plea bargain in the situation. Um, so a background check is only one part of a of a screening process that should include, um, you know, an application, interview, um, checking references. Someone should be in your church for a year or so before they take on a leadership position just so you get to know them. Um, I can give individual people more information about that. Your local safe church team person may know of a good local resource in your area where background checks can be um, gotten, and other churches are a good resource too. Where does another church go to get their background check? Okay, and just want to let our audience know that if your question cannot be answered in the depth that it needs in the webinar today, uh, your questions are captured uh, for us 
um, in, in a form, and we can put, the, uh, put those questions in the hands of today's presenters so that they can respond to you individually by email after uh, the event today. And I'm thinking, Bonnie, that in light of your, your answer that you just gave, that this question might fall into that category. It says there are different levels of background checks, and that's part of the confusion. What level should a church run and consider reliable? Yeah, that's um, that's a good question. And, I, and again, it's churches vary very much in this in terms of the resources they have. Um, and so, again, the church needs to weigh its own risks um, and costs and um, come up with what they think is best for their church. At the same time, um, again, I want to just emphasize that a background check is only part of a total screening process. And, and while you're on the subject of screening processes, it kind of leads right into um, policies and procedures. Um, how, does, uh, how are the necessity of policies communicated to church administration? The people in the webinar today may go back to their church and say, gee, there's some things we need to do. How do they, how do they communicate that best to the people that need to know in their church? That's a great question, <laughs> and I wish I had the perfect answer that worked with every church and with every council. Um, but I would say, yeah, I, I'm happy to give you um, information from Safe Church or from a Safe Church person, get another person together who agrees with you, and um, make an appointment with your church council and say, you know, I heard this on a webinar. I think our church really needs to consider this. Um, we do have people um, who have offended, who are in our churches, we need to be aware of that. We need to be considering it. We need to have a policy in place. And um, so, yeah, get someone with you who you can go together with and meet with the church council and get a little committee together to start drafting a policy for your church. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. And if you want help with that, contact a safe church person or my office. Okay. I'm um, going to jump back to questions from the audience. Um, here's one. Uh, what does the Genesis Group do? I the don't Genesis recall. Group in Grand Rapids brings together professionals and pastors and some former offenders for a monthly meeting to discuss and sh support and share. Uh, they do trainings for persons similar to what Bonnie's talking about with church groups. And it's just another resource that builds communication and transparency so that folks become more aware and are willing to collaborate with each other and know who's doing what in our community. Maybe other communities have that sort of, of network. And if not, it would be good to, to start one. Maybe your church could be the impetus to get something like that going. OK. Um, I think that's going to wrap up the time that we have for questions today during the webinar. I want to share with our audience um, and thank Carol and uh, Bonnie. I uh, hope you enjoyed presenting on this topic today. Um, I want to draw your, the audience attention to the Safe Church website. Again, it's www.crcna.org forward slash Safe Church and click on uh, the link for Abuse Awareness 2013. Bonnie, you did say that that was where most of the resources are? Yes. Okay. And um, thanks to both of you for a great presentation. And thanks to our audience for the really good questions that you sent in today. Those were, um, the answers to those were quite informative. I just want to let you know a few more things. As we um, exit the webinar today, um, that um, at the end of today's webinar, there'll be a survey that pops up in your window. And we'd like to know uh, if you like this type of topic, how did we do, did the format uh, lend itself to helping you learn more about it. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback. There's room for comments. And if you want to leave your email address uh, so that we can respond to any of your comments, um, you may do that. Otherwise, your responses are confidential. 
you can dis continue the discussion. Uh, Bonnie recently posted a blog about this very webinar, so if you would like to post comments there or start your own dis uh, discussion in one of the discussion forums, uh, Safe Church has a discussion forum. There's a number of topics that are already being discussed there. You can find them on the network at crcna.org forward slash network. And thanks to Ministry Shares, these webinars are made possible through the generous gifts of the Christian Reformed Churches in support of Ministry Shares, and they account for nearly 25% of all the ministry that we're able to do together as a denomination. Our next webinars will be announced in 2014. Uh, those of you who joined us today joined us for the last one in 2013, and we thank you for joining us today. Uh, you can keep track of what's coming up with webinars um, on our page at crcna.org forward slash webinars. You'll be able to see um, today's recording in about 24 hours. Um, you can register for upcoming webinars when the new list comes up. There's still some topics out there that are proposed for next year that are taking votes. And if you want to subscribe to the weekly newsletter that goes out every Tuesday, you can always get your webinar information on that. And that's at crcna.org forward slash uh, network. And we thank you again for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed today's topic. Thanks again to Carol and Bonnie. And until we meet again in another webinar, uh